Uh, today I'd like to present uh, Dr. Christine Watford. Uh, just as a short introduction here, uh, she grew up in uh, Seattle, Washington. She earned her Bachelor's of Science in Molecular and Cellular Endodontal Biology with a minor in Public Health from the University of Washington. She completed her Doctorate of Medicine from the University of Washington School of Medicine. And she mentioned, um, uh, oh, and she completed uh, her, uh, like I said, her Doctorate of Medicine in the University of Washington. She mentioned that she needed some time, so she moved to Miami, Florida, uh, and completed her anesthesia re uh, residency at the University of Miami in 2018. And in this residency, she gained clinical experience working with trauma and chronic pain, which sparked a lot of interest in pain management. Um, so now she's at the tail end of completing her chronic pain uh, management fellowship here at the Stanford School of Medicine. And she hopes to stay in the Bay Area once uh, she completes her training here. Uh, her special interests include wellness and complementary uh, alternative medicine. And her hobbies include eating and sleeping. So, <laughs> great. Uh, Hence this lecture. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, we're going to do that. So, I'm going to start the recording. And go. So, okay. Thank you. And thank you for having me, everybody. Thank you all for spending the evening with us as well. Uh, yeah, my main hobbies are eating and sleeping, hence this lecture, and so why it's important to me as well. Uh, in addition to that sun, as you can see, I went to Miami for a residency and needed a little more sun in my life, so decided to come to the Bay Area, primarily this area, to continue with that vitamin D. And, and continue to have that uh, sun in my life. So I don't think I'll be going back to Seattle anytime soon. Uh, so as far as pain and sleep goes, this is pretty, the combination of pain and sleep is pretty common. And I can tell you in about 100% of my patients that I see in clinic, chronic pain and sleep come almost together, almost all of the time. Uh, it's hard to say what comes first, chronic pain or a sleep disorder. So it's kind of a chicken or egg scenario here. Uh, sometimes they flip flop, sometimes they're pretty clear and clean cut, uh, but this is an important topic to me and a lot of our patients that we do see in clinic. A lot of evidence shows that there's more of an effect of sleep on chronic pain rather than vice versa but both can be uh, related in any way as well. Oops, sorry. Oh, there we go. I just wanted to start off by taking a poll. How many of you are getting over nine hours of sleep a night? You can just raise hands. Over six? Over six? a few more people. How about four, over four hours? So I'd say majority of the crowd here are getting four to six hours of sleep. Anyone below two or three? Okay. All right, great. Uh, so how much sleep should adults get is, you know, I mean, depending on what resources you look at and what sites you look at, it can vary. But across the board, adults 26 to 64 years old should be getting about seven to nine hours of sleep. Older adults 65 of age or older should be getting at least seven to eight, eight, seven to eight or hours of sleep. And this idea that adults don't need as much sleep as younger people do is completely false. We need just as much. So hopefully if you're in that range that's not getting at least seven to nine, this PowerPoint may or may not help you get to that number. <laughs> we'll see. So what happens while we sleep? We all know there are different phases to sleep. The first stage is the light sleep stage in which eye movement slow. Uh, in this stage, alpha and theta waves are produced. This lasts up to seven minutes or so. And this is also known as a cat nap stage as well. In stage two, this is a little bit deeper than stage one, still classified as light sleep. This is the, the phase in which sleep spindles are produced, and these are important for memory processing. The brain waves start to slow in this phase as well, and this is also called the power napping stage. Stage three and four are usually more of the deep sleep phases. There's no eye movement or muscle activity. The delta waves, which produce more deep and restorative sleep, are produced in this phase as well. 
This is, these phases are important because they stimulate muscle tissue repair, growth and development, uh, increases and boosts in the immune system, and energy rebuilding in general. And because this is a deeper form of sleep, it is most difficult to wake from this stage. And then there's REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep. It occurs about 90 minutes after initially falling asleep. Then we each have about five to six REM cycles a night, each lasting for about one hour. At these uh, states of sleep, our brains are more active, heart rates are up, blood pressures are, are up, our respiratory rate increases, and this is the phase in which we have more dreams. Uh, this is also a phase that's important for learning and memory, and when information is stored in the long-term memory as well. So with some pain syndromes, any stage can get disrupted uh, from sleep, and then depending on what medications you're taking, any of these phases can be disrupted as well. As we kind of alluded to earlier, it's a vicious cycle. Uh, decreased sleep can lead to poor health. This can lead to increased stress, which also can increase pain. And then it goes around and around and around uh, in both ways. So the idea is if we can help and improve one of these different factors here, then that vicious cycle is interrupted. And so one of the things we like to focus on, especially when we're treating chronic pain patients, is sleep and improving that. This is important because about 67 to 88% of patients with chronic pain complain of trouble falling asleep or maintaining restful sleep. One in four patients with chronic pain have been diagnosed with a sleep disorder by a physician. About 50% have insomnia as well as chronic pain. Uh, we do know that sleep deprivation induces hyperalgesia, meaning more pain with things that are already painful and pain can lead to daytime sleepiness and napping. On average, there's about a 42 minute sleep debt for patients with chronic pain. In patients, this is for example, um, in comparison to patients with acute pain post-operatively, they have about a 30 to 37 minute sleep debt. So compare the 42 to the 30, 37 is a pretty substantial difference with chronic pain. And how do we fix this? By making sleep a priority and addressing it early on. As part of the clinical evaluation when there is a sleep order that's involved, evaluation by your own physician, either your primary care or your chronic pain physician could include looking at your sleep diary, seeing what your habits are, total time you're spending in bed, how long it's taking you to fall asleep, how long it's taking you to wake up from sleep, and how often are you waking up in the middle of the night and do you feel refreshed upon waking up in the mornings? More specialized things, uh, once you're referred to sleep medicine, could, in, can, could include polysomnography, which is essentially a sleep study, and actigraphy, which is basically a watch that's applied that monitors ambient light and then motor movement from you while you are sleeping. So another form of a sleep study. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea may be something that's very familiar to all of you. You probably know somebody that has it or you yourself may have it. This is a breathing disorder that also causes uh, sleep disruption. And oftentimes, this is something we don't like to look past in treating patients with chronic pain because this is something can, that can be addressed in improving chronic pain as well. So it's, it's a a diagnosis in which you have to fulfill criterion C here, which demonstrates overnight monitoring with five or more obstructed breathing events per hour or 30 events per six hours of sleep. These events may include any combination of obstructive apnea, hypopnea, or respiratory effort-related arousals. And the most telltale sign of having obstruction is someone who's snoring basically. Uh, they can also fulfill either A or B, so either excessive daytime sleepiness that's not demonstrated by any other factors, or two of, or, or two of more of the following, choking or gasping during sleep, uh, recurrent awakenings from sleep, unrefreshing sleep, daytime fatigue, and impaired concentration. Management of obstructive sleep apnea can be pretty uh, mainstream. Usually there are positive pressure airway devices in the form of face masks. There are even nasal appliances available as well. Uh, 
Positioning usually preferred is upright positioning because it relieves the obstruction. Cervical interventions can include tonsillectomies, adeno adenoidectomies to, to remove any excess tissue that may be contributing to obstruction while sleeping as well. And then weight loss because it does, it can help to decrease some of that soft, increased soft tissue in the posterior oral pharynx. Now, in moving on to management of sleep disorders in general, we like to separate them into two different categories. There's pharmacological, which are all of the medications, bless you, and non-pharmacological slash behavioral lifestyle modifications that you can take part, take part in as well. So in terms of medications, these are medications that are FDA, FDA approved for insomnia. There are a lot of them, but I'll kind of touch, uh, touch on them very briefly so that you, that you can familiar, familiarize yourself with them. The first one is a class of benzodiazepines. This may be pretty familiar to most of you. Their examples are flurazepam, restoril, which is also temazepam, triazolam, estazolam, as well as quiazepam here on the next slide. Uh, these are medications that, that act on GABA A receptors. They're GABA agonists and they can cause uh, improvements in sleep onset as well as sleep maintenance insomnia. These are medications that you have to be very careful with. You avoid them with alcohol or even concurrent opioid use because they can lead to respiratory depression. Uh, these are also medications that you have to be very careful with, with liver disease, and they're also uh, controlled substances. And these medications are not only used for sleep, but they're also used for anxiety. Some may also use them for muscle relaxants. They're, they also help with uh, controlling and stopping seizures as well. So those are other, other uh, effects they can have on the body. Non-benzodiazepines, which can be even more familiar, they act like the benzodiazepines on the same receptor. Uh, these are medications like Ambien, uh, Sonata, and Lunesta. And these are medications in which they help promote either sleep onset insomnia. Uh, Lunesta here improves sleep onset as well as sleep maintenance. And in the next slide, I'll show you some latest developments on these cl this class of medications as well. Uh, the last class here that you'll see, Rosarum, they're melatonin agonists. And melatonin is a hormone that's actually produced by the pineal gland, and it promotes the sleep-wake cycle, so it regulates the circadian, circadian rhythm. As we get older, uh, melatonin levels decrease, so it becomes a little more important to help supplement that melatonin in order to improve sleep onset as well. Um, melatonin generally improves sleep onset by about seven minutes. A lot of studies show it doesn't really prolong uh, sleep maintenance, but it does help you get to sleep a little bit faster. This is a new development that occurred as of last week, uh, Ambien Lunesta, as well as Sonata, so all of these non-benzodiazepine medications you see up here, uh, they have been known to produce complex sleep behaviors, and this means uh, behaviors like sleepwalking, suicide has even been documented, uh, as well as other, other behaviors that can compromise their well-being without patients even knowing about this. So because of this known uh, factor, this, the FDA has actually put on the toughest label on these medications, and this is a black box warning on either three of those medications. Uh, this was based actually on 66 case studies in which 20 of them were fatal. These patients actually died from suicides, drowning, motor vehicle collisions, all of these things they were doing without really knowing that they were doing them. Uh, the other, the remainder of them, 46 cases were non-fatal, but these patients, again, took part in all of these complex sleep behaviors that did put their lives at risk. Uh, so basically, if you are on any of these medications or if you know somebody that's on these medications, I would talk to your provider uh, right away about them. And if, you, if you've experienced some of these behaviors, even sleepwalking while on this medication, it'd be worth uh, stopping the medication and having a further discussion with your providers as well. 
Other medications include Belsomera, which is an orexin receptor antagonist. Orexin is actually a neuropeptide that promotes wakefulness. And in patients with narcolepsy, they actually lack orexin. So this medication is pretty useful in those patients with that sleep disorder. Helps with sleep onset and sleep maintenance insomnia. Antihistamines, which, uh, which should sound familiar to you, are Benadryl and Unisom. Benadryl is often used for allergies as well. These things are used for sleep onset as well as sleep maintenance as well. Uh, they can help if you take them 30 minutes before bedtime. And then the next ones, tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, which include doxepin, that's similar to either nortriptyline or amitriptyline can be used for sleep maintenance. Uh, barbiturates, which are usually a little, um, they're a little older, butarbital, secobarbital, these are used for short-term treatment of sleep onset and sleep maintenance. And the reason why is because they lose efficacy within about two weeks, so they become very ineffective and uh, they're not really used as much for sleep. Additional medications that are off-label uses for insomnia that you might that might sound familiar are trazodone. It was FDA approved for depression more than 30 years ago as a serotonin receptor modulator, uh, and then it can be started at between tw 25 to 50 milligrams, up titrated to 100 milligrams for sleep. Mirtazapine, which is also approved for depression can be used uh, at 30 milligrams for insomnia and increasing the dosing of it diminishes sedation as well. And then there are the atypical antipsychotics, which are quietapine, which is also Seroquel, Olanzapine, which is Zyprexa, and then Respiradone, which is Respiradol. Uh, that can have off-label uses as well if you have very difficult to treat insomnia. On to complementary alternative medications for sleep. These are things that include valerian and kava, which act on the GABA receptors and benzodiazepine binding sites, similar to Ambien, similar to uh, temazepam, Restoril. However, there's no long-term data for their use in chronic insomnia. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit to lifestyle behavioral changes. And this is kind of the meat of this talk in which I hope that you're able to take away some of this to apply to your uh, daily lives as well. So this has to do with sleep routines and what do you do if you can't fall asleep and what can you do, what can you incorporate into um, improving your sleep habits as well. This includes things like sleep hygiene, relaxation training, cognitive therapy, stimulus control, and sleep restriction therapy, and all of these things we'll go through. Sleep hygiene, uh, the first thing is minimize daytime napping. Uh, it's Usually, I mean, it, it's okay to take a 15 to 30 minute nap about seven to nine hours after waking, but anything beyond that, anything longer actually uh, can actually help, uh, help. I mean, it makes difficult, nighttime sleeping very, very difficult. So we usually try, try to minimize daytime napping and encourage against it with our patients. Uh, having consistent, consistent bedtimes, regular exercise early on in the day as opposed to late at night, limiting exposure to bright lights two hours prior to bedtime, limiting psychological stressors uh, in terms of practicing relaxation techniques that we'll go over. Uh, some of our patients who describe having, having minds that are just on overdrive as they're trying to fall asleep describe making lists during the day of everything they need to do uh, and then checking things off as they go on throughout the day so that by the time they're laying down to go to sleep, they have a list of everything that they've already done or a list of things that they need to do the next day. And it kind of puts a stop to the activity during that day. So a lot of them have actually described that making lists and checking things off has helped with their sleep hygiene as well. Uh, stopping or limiting caffeine consumption, keeping in mind that caffeine can actually stay in our systems for our up to 14 hours and limiting evening alcohol intake. It might sound contrary, but 
alcohol can initially make you fall asleep in the beginning, but later it's actually activating so it can disrupt uh, refreshing sleep. As far as sleeping environments, we usually recommend cool, dark, and silent sleeping environments and using the bed only for intimacy and for sleep, no other activities. Now, as far as relaxation training goes, there are multiple relaxation training techniques that you can uh, look up or even uh, participate in if these things aren't, aren't something that you're really interested in. But these are the two that I have found to be the most effective and things you can actually utilize during the day to practice, maybe as you're sitting at work or reading in a quiet place uh, and then these are things you can apply as you're lying in bed trying to go to sleep. So I actually um, figure we can try to practice some of these things as well. This first technique is progressive muscle relaxation. The idea behind this is that you can tense up muscles and then relax them, focus on the relaxation of these muscles and how uh, it helps relieve anxiety because it's thought that we hold a lot of uh, anxiety and stress within our muscles. So this, this training technique actually goes through multiple muscle groups in which you can practice tensing, relaxing, and seeing how it affects you as well. Uh, so we can try this, we won't try the whole thing, uh, but we can start on a couple of muscle groups. So first I'll have everybody close your eyes and just take three breaths in, through your nose, out through your mouth. Relax your muscles, focus on how relaxed those muscles are. And one more breath. Now turn your attention to your right foot. Focus on how that feels at this second. Now take 10 seconds to tense those muscles in that right foot. Just that right foot. Focus on how that feels. Continue to tense it. It shouldn't be to the point where you're cramping your muscles. And five more seconds of holding that tensing. And now slowly release that tension in the right foot. Focus on how that relaxation feels and how it's making the rest of your body feel. Continue to take those nice deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. Now your foot should be completely relaxed. So now I want you to take 10 seconds to just focus in on how relaxed your whole body is at this second. Continue with that deep breathing. Now we're gonna focus on the left foot. And we're gonna do the same thing on that left foot. Start to tense up those muscles in that left foot. Focus on how that feels and continue your breathing. Again, nice, tense pressure, no cramping. Go ahead and start to relax that left foot. Focus on all the tension releasing from your body. Nice deep breaths. And now concentrate on what it feels like to have all your muscle group relax, relax at this point. And then you can open your eyes. So that's just a little snippet of what progressive muscle relaxation is. So in this chart here, you can see you start at the bottom at the feet and then you move up through the calves, move up through the lower extremities and eventually to the top of your head. And this is something you can do even when you're sitting uh, throughout the day and at home while you're lying down, just focusing on trying to fall asleep as well. This is something that takes practice, uh, so it's not going to be effective in allowing you to fall asleep almost instantly. It takes at least, at least a couple sessions per day for about a couple weeks, I would say, to notice anything uh, and its effects on your sleep. 
The next form of relaxation training includes deep breathing techniques. This is one of them. There are many if you Google deep breathing techniques, uh, but this was one that was developed by Dr. Andrew Weil, who was a primary care physician at Harvard. He had a special interest in wellness, and he swears that if you do this technique two times a day for two months straight, you actually can fall asleep within one minute. Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, I think it would be worth practicing. So we can practice this one as well. Uh, it involves four seconds of inhalation, holding your breath for seven seconds, and then exhaling for eight seconds. And don't worry if you can't hold your breath or exhale or inhale for that many. I think the ratio of the three different uh, movements is what's most important. So we'll, we'll practice this one as well. Uh, everyone close your eyes. Now position your tongue so that the tip of it is resting against the ridge of tissue behind your upper front teeth. Now exhale through your mouth. Make sure you're making a whooshing sound. And then close and inhale for four seconds. One, two, three, four. Hold, seven seconds, a little hard. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven and exhale through your mouth for eight seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the idea behind this, you can open your eyes, the idea behind this is you repeat it for three, three more times, and eventually your endurance increases. You're able to follow these exact same ratios in seconds, and if you practice, then it's, it's uh, supposed to help you fall asleep faster at night. Other forms of relaxation training to consider are forms like Im imagery and self-hypnosis. These are things that a lot of therapists can train you on. Uh, does take practice, like I said, all of these techniques to really notice an effect on uh, sleep improvement. But they do work and I use them. <laughs> I wanted to mention one of these apps since um, <coughs> Excuse me. Since uh, we're all very technologically focused nowadays, uh, this app is a meditation app, and it uh, contains 30, 30 minutes of relaxation techniques. So there's actually someone speaking to you and helping you guide through all of this. I know it kind of, uh, it kind of defeats the purpose of eliminate, eliminating stimuli and use of electronics prior to going to bed, but if you need a little bit of structure and help with relaxation techniques while you're preparing to go to bed, uh, I think it's very useful. Cognitive therapy for insomnia directly is also offered here at Stanford. Uh, it can guide patients through series of changes in sleep-related behaviors. So it focuses on addressing these factors that contribute to the persistence of insomnia. These are things like conditioned arousal, identifying and eliminating habits that were developed in an effort to improve sleep but have become ineffective and reducing sleep-related worry and other sources of heightened arousal. Uh, this has been pretty effective for our patients. Usually after two sessions, they'll notice an improvement. Sometimes it'll take up to six to eight sessions over the course of six to eight weeks. And these are additional apps for CDT insomnia as well. Sleepio, I believe, is very limited in accessibility. I think it's offered through various healthcare organizations. I don't think we offer it through Stanford, uh, unfortunately. Shut-Eye is another app you can find. However, it costs about $149 for a 26-week session of it. But again, if you do have to pay for CBT insomnia, it can be a little bit cheaper than actually going in person and participating. Uh, the last app, CBTI, is an app that was developed by the VA here in Palo Alto as well as Stanford Medicine. It's actually available to uh, everybody, not just VA patients. And it helps to if you don't have access to a CBTI course or a therapist that can help you with this. And they've actually, all of these apps in the studies that have been done have been proven to be just as effective of going, uh, just as effective as going to these sessions in person as well. Stimulus control. Uh, these are things that 
that are also addressed in CBT insomnia as well. These are things we kind of touched on earlier. This, these are avoid excessive napping during the day. Like I said, 15 to 30 minute naps are okay about seven to nine hours after waking up. However, anything longer than that or anything beyond that is not recommended. Uh, getting out of bed when you're not sleepy and only returning when sleepy again is beneficial having regular morning rise times every day of the week as well, and then going to bed only when sleepy. Sleep restriction therapy is also another form of uh, behavioral modifications to consider. This is based on the idea that excess time in bed makes sleep problems worse. Uh, so it's designed to eliminate prolonged middle of the night awakenings. It consists of limiting a person's time in bed to only that time when he or she is sleeping. So the idea behind it is, say you take a person who sleeps from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, you take them and usually say they go to bed around 11 p.m. They rise at 6 a.m. What you would do is you would restrict them to only being in bed when they sleep. So that's midnight to 6 a.m. And then if along the course of this therapy, if they start to have decreased middle of the night awakenings, you start to increase their total time in bed by about 15 minutes to 30 minutes per session. And eventually they get to the point where their middle of the night awakenings are a lot less. And this is something you can try at home as well. It uh, is a little bit it's a little bit rough in the beginning because you limit your time to being in bed only when you're sleeping. So there's not a lot of time to just relax prior, but over the course of this therapy, it's actually has proven to help with uh, sleep onset and maintenance. So when is it time to see a sleep doctor? We get these questions a lot. My own personal practice is to involve sleep medicine early. Uh, it's, it's helpful to get their opinions on things. If there are additional tests that may be needed, they can help initiate these things like sleep studies as well. But the idea is that by all of you participating in this lecture, hopefully you can take some of these lifestyle modifications and start them early because of those are gonna be main things that sleep medicine will help you uh, learn as well. So as far as the take home messages go, sleep and pain can be directly related and they can be a vicious cycle when one of them is disrupted. Sleep aids can be effective when used under the supervision of a physician. And then sleep has been proven to improve by these behavioral modifications that we uh, just talked about, including sleep hygiene, relaxation training, cognitive therapy, stimulus control, and sleep, rest, sleep restriction therapy. So our hope is that you can take some of these uh, behavioral modifications and apply them to your daily lives in order to help sleep. And that's the conclusion. <laughs> Thank you. I'll leave it at that.